elections. It didn't happen, uh, primarily because President Putin wants to avoid a direct confrontation with the United States and NATO. He's never wanted it. We're the ones that goaded him into attacking into eastern Ukraine to begin with. We're the ones that wanted to place forces right on his border with the goal of attacking him. We're the ones that wanted to place missile systems there. So I think <clears throat> it's very obvious that uh, under the circumstances, he could have uh, attacked with any number of different weapon systems a long time ago, and he hasn't done it. I hope he uh, can continue to exercise restraint because I think we're nearing the end of this tragedy, frankly. Russia has long warned that if Ukraine persists in its attacks on Russian territory, it will create a buffer zone to push Ukrainian capabilities back, preventing them from reaching Russian land. In response to these ongoing attacks, President Putin has announced that Russia is now in the process of establishing this buffer zone. While Putin's stated goal is to capture the city of Kharkov, this is actually a secondary outcome of creating the buffer zone designed to secure Russian borders. This buffer will effectively shield Russia from Ukrainian strikes, even as it advances towards Kharkov. The primary aim of this offensive is not just to protect Russian territory, but to further weaken the already depleted Ukrainian military, aligning with the broader demilitarization goals of Russia's special military operation. By creating this buffer zone, Russia intends to diminish Ukraine's defensive capabilities and force the diversion of Ukrainian reserves from the critical Eastern Front. This strategy is designed to strain Ukraine's resources even further, impacting their ability to effectively engage along the main line of contact with Russia. Ukraine is facing severe challenges as it grapples with insufficient manpower and stretched resources. Troops initially assigned to delay Russian advances have been diverted to Kharkov, where they've suffered heavy losses and entire brigades have been decimated. Other units have refused to engage, recognizing the futility of their situation. The collapse in the north has depleted Ukraine's strategic reserves, leaving the previous line of contact critically undermanned. Russian forces are making significant advances as a result. It's anticipated that one to three additional fronts may soon open design to further stretch Ukrainian defenses to their breaking point. Speculation suggests that by the time these new fronts are established, particularly in the Zaporizhia region, Ukrainian forces could be severely diminished, leading to a dramatic reversal of fortunes. While Ukrainian forces are holding on to prepared positions, the success of these positions relies on the ability to rotate units in and out for rest and reorganization. The Ukrainians are facing a dire situation with their brigades as they lack the capacity to rotate out exhausted units. The brigades currently on the front lines are being continuously overwhelmed, leading to severe attrition. If these units remain in place, they risk complete annihilation. Ukraine faces a critical choice, either sacrifice these brigades, depleting their forces or attempt to preserve their combat effectiveness by withdrawing them to new defensive positions. However, the challenge is compounded by the fact that they have not prepared these new positions thoroughly or extensively across the entire front. There are a few strategically chosen areas where high-profile preparations have been made, often highlighted during tours by leaders like Zelensky. However, these efforts cover only a small portion of the front line. It's reminiscent of the Maginot Line, just as the Germans bypassed it by going around, the Russians could similarly circumvent these prepared positions. This would render the defenses ineffective, leaving the troops in those areas vulnerable to heavy bombardment from munitions like FAB-500 and FAB-1500. In such scenarios, the risk of significant casualties is high, with troops potentially facing devastating losses. Or they retreat but retreat to where? With no prepared positions to fall back on, this could lead to a chaotic panic retreat, even an outright rout, as Ukrainian forces scramble across the Dnieper River, hoping to use it as a natural barrier against advancing Russian forces. This is why, back in March, Russia announced the creation of the Dnieper River flotilla. Why establish such a flotilla unless Russia plans to control the Dnieper? It suggests that Russia intends to make the river part of its line of contact with Ukraine. The current offensive in Kharkov serves not only to eliminate Ukrainian forces and create a buffer zone, 
but also to provide operational and strategic opportunities for the Russian military, allowing them to leverage their growing superiority in manpower and equipment. Each day, Russia grows stronger, with their losses being replaced faster than Ukraine can replace its own dwindling forces. The military equation is shifting dramatically in Russia's favor. To understand the potential outcome, look to World War II's Operation Begretchen, where the destruction of Germany's Army Group Center mirrors what may soon happen to Ukraine's forces. One of the key points in that article is the assumption that NATO holds a technological superiority over Russia, which, if fully deployed in Ukraine, could shift the balance in Ukraine's favor. While it's true that NATO has capabilities not yet utilized in the conflict, it's also true that Russia possesses untapped capabilities. What we've observed, though, is that every time a NATO asset, whether it's MRs, a TACMS, Leopard tanks, or Bradleys, gets introduced, the Russians quickly find a countermeasure. It's also crucial to remember what General Christopher Cavalli said in early 2023 at a Swedish defense forum. He emphasized that NATO has not fully grasped the scope and scale of the violence occurring in Ukraine. This statement is significant because in the military, everything from organizational structure to tactics and logistics is based on the conflicts you're preparing for, which are imagined scenarios. This planning covers everything, ammunition usage, fuel needs, air support, artillery communications, and electronic warfare. All of this is envisioned beforehand because that's how military operations work. You pull the plan off the shelf, open it up, and execute it step by step. For example, an operation plan might outline the use of two corps for an advance with a third in reserve organized into battalions. The challenge, however, is that much of this thinking dates back to the Cold War, and today's warfare is not the Cold War. The plans NATO wants to implement, including how specific weapons systems like a TACMS are employed, are rooted in Cold War strategies. For instance, a TACMS was designed to suppress enemy air defenses, a tactic used during the Second Gulf War to target Iraqi defenses and artillery command. But warfare has evolved. The introduction of HIMARS taught the Russians not to concentrate their command and control in one forward post, which used to be vulnerable to precision strikes. The battlefield today requires a much more adaptive approach as older strategies don't align with the modern dynamics of warfare. The Russians have adapted to modern warfare, particularly in how they handle command and control. In the past, target coordinates from scient and satellite imagery could pinpoint a forward command post, allowing systems like HIMARS to strike with precision. But the Russians have learned from these attacks. Now, they maintain multiple command posts, an A, B, and C system, constantly jumping and moving. While one post is operational, another is being set up, and a third is being rebuilt. This ensures that even if one post is hit, command and control is never fully lost as the others are ready to take over. Similarly, Russian logistics have evolved. They no longer store all their ammunition in a single forward depot which could be easily targeted and destroyed. Instead, they've adopted a more flexible, dispersed approach to logistics, making it much harder for the enemy to deliver a decisive blow to their supply chain. This level of adaptability contrasts sharply with the operational plans NATO might have envisioned, which are still rooted in older strategies. The Russians have significantly adjusted their logistics strategy by keeping their ammunition further in the rear and bringing it forward in smaller, more dispersed packets. This approach makes their supply lines harder to target, even though it slows the pace of combat. While this method may limit Russia's ability to conduct large sweeping offensives, it ensures they can maintain continuous firepower without risking a major disruption to their logistics. Russia has effectively rewritten the rules of warfare in response to modern battlefield realities, adapting in ways that NATO's current warfighting methods haven't accounted for. NATO's operational plans still reflect tactics that may have been valid in in 2022, but the Russians adapt quickly. Their military academies continuously refine their strategies. The U.S. has a similar process through institutions like the School of Advanced Military Studies, SAMS at Fort Leavenworth, which played a key role during the first Gulf War. 
Sams was tasked with devising the famous Hail Mary maneuver, fixing the Iraqi forces in place while a U.S. course executed a left hook, attacking through an unprotected flank to strike the rear. It was seen as a brilliant example of maneuver warfare at the time, but the battlefield today is much more dynamic with adversaries like Russia rapidly adjusting their tactics. The premise that NATO holds technological superiority over Russia, which, if fully unleashed in Ukraine, could decisively tip the scales is fundamentally flawed. While NATO certainly has capabilities that haven't been fully applied, Russia also possesses untapped capabilities. Every time NATO introduces a new system, Hymer as a TACMS, Leopard tanks or Bradleys, the Russians quickly adapt. Russia Moreover, General Christopher Cavalier stated in early 2023 that NATO hadn't fully grasped the scale of the conflict, emphasizing that NATO's current understanding doesn't reflect the full scope of violence in Ukraine. Military doctrine is based on pre-imagined conflict scenarios from logistics to battlefield maneuvers. However, NATO's doctrine, rooted in Cold War thinking, hasn't kept pace with the realities on the ground today. Russia, in contrast, rapidly adjusts its tactics. Their logistics, for instance, have evolved. Rather than risk large ammo depots near the front lines, they now keep supplies further back and move them forward in smaller, harder-to-target packages. While this slows down the pace of combat, it makes their logistics more resilient, allowing for sustained battlefield lethality. The Russian military is continuously learning from the front lines. Leaders who demonstrate innovative tactics are pulled from the battlefield, brought to their military academies to refine those ideas and swiftly integrate them in updated.